this hatred of Hindus, for example, is because of white racism. Now, that's so completely anachronistic. Where are these people, you know? Are they not opening their eyes? You see, because in the colonial period there was indeed white supremacism, you know, they feel comfortable morally, you see, they feel so, so superior. Look, they are racist and we are not, we are superior. And so they get off on this feeling of moral superiority that they continue with whatever happens in the real world. Like, for instance, the Leicester riots. You see, until before the Leicester riots, Hindus would always say, oh, it's white racism. Well, at least in the Leicester riots, it could not be denied anymore. This was the work of Pakistanis. Okay, let's start. So let's decolonize the Hindu mind. You see, that was the title of my own doctoral dissertation, uh, defended in 1998, and which appeared as a book in India in 2001. Uh, for one week, it was number one in the nonfiction bestsellers list of the newspaper Asian Age. So it's a book I rather like. At any rate, I think it was, it was necessary that it appeared. It gave a perspective on the Hindu movement that was very rare at the time. So um, the word decolonizing, of course, I used that before it became a vogue as it is now. And so it gives me a certain local standing in the present woke atmosphere where everybody's decolonizing. Um, you know, I can say, ah, well, you see, in tempore non suspecto, I was already busy with decolonizing. Mm -hmm. But then again, you see, the popularity of this word is a bit strange because actual decolonization happened 75 years ago. That's when India was decolonized. So people who are now kicking against uh, uh, the colonizers of yore, they are beating a dead horse. They are acting very brave. Look, you see, I dare to beat that horse. Yeah, but that horse is dead already long ago. Um, so how to recognize a decolonizer? You know, they're fairly, you know, populous uh, species these days. You know, they talk about colonialism and neocolonialism and post-colonialism all the time. And they reduce very many phenomena to this colonial theme. They see the pre-colonial past through the lenses of the colonial period. In my research about the uh, Aryan invasion theory, the homeland of Indo-European, I see this all the time. Um, people on both sides, but let's for now focus on the Hindu side. Um, they see the distant past through the lenses of the colonial period. Like, you know, they talk about you know, Max Müller said this and Macaulay said that and so on. This is all in 19th or 20th century. You know, Michael Witzel says this and that. Well, I don't care, you know. I mean, among scholars, of course, once in a while you have to deal with this. But what really interests me is what happened 6,000 years ago, long before colonization. And these things, you see, they did not do just to allow the colonialists to say this and do that. You know, they had nothing to do with colonialism. And that's far more interesting. You know, that's, that's something that a historian worthy of his trade can want to do. You know, finding out what happened to this origin of the Proto-Indo-Europeans and so on, whereas this talk about, you know, Max Müller and so on, so trite, it's so recent, anybody can read this, anybody can read the, the English of Max Müller, you know, it's not like you have to decipher Sumerian or the Harappan languages or, I mean, come on, you see, this is not interesting. Um, then they see everything that is attributed to colonialism as willful. Nothing ever happens innocently. For example, 
the Bengali famine. Now that was not innocent. That really wasn't innocent, and yet it was a bit more innocent than it's usually made out to be. You see, Hindus say all the time, oh, Winston Churchill committed genocide. You know, and effectively three, four million Bengalis were killed, which is more than the number of Armenians killed in the genocide. Uh, well, not really. You see, genocide means intention. It means not just killing, it means wanting to kill. Now, Winston Churchill had contempt for Hindus, okay? You know, he called India a beastly people with a beastly religion. Nevertheless, he had no intention of killing them. What? He didn't care. Now, when they started dying, and he had to decide whether to provide grain to these people or to provide grain to his troops, then he made a choice that caused the death of so many people. Now, it's a bit of an ambiguous case. He did make a choice that ultimately led to mass dying. Nevertheless, he still had no intention of killing them. It's only the lesser evil. It was collateral damage. And so many times in history, things happen that have not been intended. The biggest genocide, or at least the biggest mass killing in history, was collateral damage. It was for 0% a genocide. I mean the Great Leap Forward by Mao Zedong. You see, he caused hunger. Now, when Stalin caused hunger in Ukraine in 1932, that was willful. He wanted people to die. In the case of Mao Zedong, not at all. He thought he was doing good. He thought he was lifting people of, out of agrarian life into industrial life by forcing the farmers to set up steel factories and produce steel. So the whole agricultural system was in jeopardy, mm -hmm. resulting in famines. Mm -hmm. And then because of the communist system, the local governors didn't dare to report to the capital, look, you see, this is what's happening. We're, we're having famines. People are dying. Mm -hmm. They didn't dare to say it. So Mao Zedong thought, oh, this is a success. Let's continue. And so for a few years, it went on. Between 30 and 46 million people have died, biggest in history biggest man-made mass dying in history. And yet, he hadn't wanted to kill anyone. He was a great killer in the Civil War, 46, 49. He killed plenty of people. In the Cultural Revolution, 66 and so on, he killed many people. But the Great Leap Forward was not an effort at killing. So it was collateral damage. And so this has happened many times in history. The um, so-called genocide by the Spanish in America. You see, I myself in my book, Negationism in India, I have given it as an example of great genocide. I was wrong. Because that was not genocide. The, the Spanish had no intention of killing everyone. They wanted to enslave them. They wanted to convert them to Christianity. They didn't necessarily want to kill them. Now, if they died, you know, it was no big deal. But nevertheless, they didn't want to kill them. You see, they brought diseases with them, and these diseases spread long, uh, you know, ahead of the Spanish troops, and they killed people. So, um, so not everything that happened under the colonial regime uh, can be seen as a colonial conspiracy against everyone else. So I think that this present vogue of colonial talk is a case of the cult of victimhood. You see, nowadays there's a premium on being a victim, so one thing you can be is a victim of colonialism. Some examples. Um, Ayodhya is said to be due to British machinations. This was the first line of the eminent historians in the Ayodhya debate around 1990. They said, oh, you see, this was a British machination to pit Hindus against Muslims. Now, you see, this couldn't be, I mean, the text didn't bear it out. It's also not logical. You see, there are so many mosques in India that are built on destroyed temples. In quite a few, this is also visible. Like in the Gyan Wapi Mosque in Varanasi, you still see part of the temple walls in the mosque walls. And that's on purpose 
because they wanted to show off the victory over the infidels. So since these were all around, why would the British have to invent one? Uh, so this was not due to British machination, it was much older. So this line of argument was also you know, abandoned and then they invented new things. Uh, then the partition is attributed to British intrigue, the practically easiest way of getting everybody in the audience clapping is by saying, ah, the British inflicted partition on the Indians. Mm -hmm. Now, the British tried to stop partition. You see, the partition resolution was passed by the Muslim League in 1940. Six years after that, the British were still telling Gina to his face, we will never countenance partition. Even if we have to relinquish our Indian colony, we want to keep it in one piece. So this was started by the Muslim League. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Congress historiography of after independence, they didn't like to say that mm -hmm. because they wanted to tell the Muslims, oh, no, you are part of it. And they wanted to tell the Hindus, oh, there's nothing wrong with the Muslims and so on. So they didn't like to highlight the Muslim responsibility for partition. Mm -hmm. So they blamed the British also, you see, helped by the story, or shall I say the myth, that Congress chased the British out. So you see the British were the bad guys, so why not blame them mm -hmm. rather than blame anyone else? Um, so the whole communal problem was due to divide and rule, as if there hadn't been a Hindu-Muslim enmity before the British. Same thing with the caste uh, conflicts. You see there, many Hindu apologists nowadays say, oh no, Hindu, Hinduism has no caste, it's all due to British machinations. Now, I understand that the British, also not on purpose, but nevertheless, have aggravated the caste problem by their census operation. Everybody had to come under a caste title. Um, but nevertheless, caste existed long before the British. Simple. Um, and long before the Sultan, long before the Muslim invasions, you can't blame them. There are certain things you can blame them for, but not caste. The idea that the Aryan invasion theory was a British machination, also to divide and rule, nonsense. It started by some, you know, some, some German uh, working in a dusty library, thinking up the Aryan invasion theory as the best possible explanation for a number of linguistic data that he tried to explain. And then later, the British administrator said, oh, but this is useful. Now we can tell the Hindus, oh, but we aren't really invaders, at least not more than you. You know, okay, we invaded, but so did you. And, and so that was very useful. Um, and then in the, in the racist worldview, it was also very useful. Like the dynamic whites, you see, we invaded the country of these indolent, dark, aboriginals, you know. Uh, no, I mean, it started as a linguistic theory on the basis of linguistic data, and only later it got other, you know, political applications. It is said that Christianity was brought into India as an instrument of empire, and then later also as an instrument of American for foreign policy. Well, that has been added to it, that's temporarily true, but you see, Christianity has its own agenda. And yes. Christian missionaries would be coming here even if there was no British Empire and so on. In China, it's forbidden to convert people. And still the missionaries are boasting that they have converted millions of Chinese. So then I've even read that Islamic terrorism caused by Pakistan is admittedly caused by Pakistan in a direct sense, but behind Pakistan there's the United States. The Americans tell Pakistan, now come on, try some terrorism. What more do you want, you know? Or, for instance, the role of English is blamed on T.B. Macaulay. Now, Macaulay was, of course, an advocate of English education. He thought he was doing good to the Indians. You know, he thought that the Indians were nice people, they should be brought back to independence. But that can only happen once they become civilized. 
And that they will only do through <laughs> English education. Now, okay, you see that a British administrator thought of serving British interests. That's mm -hmm. nothing special. Mm -hmm. You see, the really special thing is that Jawaharlal Nehru mm -hmm. then continued this pro-English policy yes. when there was no political reason anymore to do so. In the discourse of decolonization, mm -hmm. many Hindu apologists turn out to be white supremacists. You see, for being a white supremacist, it is not necessary to be white. You know, many people think that nothing ever moves, like for instance, Pakistan commits terrorism in India. It can't happen unless there is the CIA behind it. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever happens in this world unless there is a white hand behind it. Now that's what I call white supremacism. And so, you see, the, the, the actual facts, you know, that you just see in the news, you don't have to make any deep study or so, you just watch the TV news, you will see that in America they have had, you know, Colin Powell as their uh, commander, they've had Foreign Minister Condoleezza Rice, they even had the president, the number one, Barack Obama, and, and, and then you see many other people in the administration are Hispanic and, and even Indian, yeah? Um, and so to describe this as many Hindus still do, a white racist, you know, this hatred of Hindus, for example, is because of white racism. Now that's so completely anachronistic. Where are these people, you know? Are they not opening their eyes? You see, because in the colonial period there was indeed white supremacism, you know, they feel comfortable morally, you see, they feel so, so superior. Look, they are racist and we are not, we are superior. And so they get off on this feeling of moral superiority that they continue with whatever happens in the real world. Um, like for instance, the Leicester riots. You see, until before the Leicester riots, Hindus would always say, oh, it's white racism. Well, at least in the Leicester riots, it could not be denied anymore. This was the work of Pakistanis. And so, you see, the, the religious conflict of South Asia is now fully, maturely transported to Britain. Then there is the Orientalism discourse. That's also part of this. So Edward Said had this conspiracy theory that all the Orientalists, that is to say, scholars of Oriental cultures, were in fact agents of the colonial project. Um, so in his attempt to uh, show this, uh, there are very many factual errors. Uh, like, for instance, something very basic. He doesn't talk about German language Orientalism, whereas Germany and the German-speaking world was the mainstay of Orientalism. And you, most of the ideas and so on came from there. He doesn't know German. No, of course, I, I don't want to make a big thing of this, but the result is that he makes many mistakes. And, and more fundamentally, of course, he makes the mistake of projecting an intention. You know, the typical conspiracy theory. You see, anything that happens, certain ideas of the Orientalists played into the hand of the colonial projects. Others did not. And so you have very many people who go native, who study Oriental cultures and fall in love with them. And they're no longer agents of of somehow subduing these cultures, on the contrary, they start defending these cultures. So you see, all that comes in the way of Edward Said's Oriental, Orientalism thesis, which nonetheless rules the rules by now, at least in the, in the Anglosphere. Uh, what is really comical about the Hindu enthusiasm for the whole Orientalism discourse is that this was created in the service of Islam. You see, Edward Said is quite explicit about that. He's busy with, you know, accusing, for instance, the Western media of being anti-Islamic. Now, maybe he's wrong, and indeed I think he's wrong, but at least he's serving the interest of Muslims. So if Muslims run away with his thesis, that I can understand. If Hindus do that, sorry, but that's comical. That, you know, Hindus who just don't realize what they're doing. Okay, so you see, my advice for all these decolonizers, and as the author of a hefty 
doctoral book about decolonizing, I suggest you stop this, this whole decolonization. Down with decolonization. You know, the, the intervening colonial period can, of course, be studied. But the whole previous part of history, which is much longer, can be studied without reference to colonialism. Modern history also can increasingly be studied without reference to colonialism. You see, my country, Belgium, used to have a colony in Africa, Congo, and so we've been following the news from Africa uh, rather well. And so whenever an African dictator, you know, plunders his own country, puts everything away in a Swiss bank account, you know, jeopardizes the economy and whatever. You see, then when, when he's asked about it, he'll say, ah, oh, no, 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 it's the guilt of colonialism. You know, this is the heritage of colonialism, which becomes, of course, ever less credible, you know, as time passes. And so, you know, we have this healthy skepticism of the word colonialism. And so I think here more and more, as I studied it more closely, it's very obvious, you see, this is a thing of the past. You know, colonialism can be taken serious as an event in history that has already happened. I knew Sitaram Goel and Ram Sarup personally. They had been actual freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. Ram Sarup spent time in prison because of his activity in the Quit India movement. Now, they never talked about decolonization. For them, decolonization is an event that took place in 1947. And after that, they turned the page. And from then on, India was its own boss. And so if there's someone to be criticized, it was Nehru, it was Indira, and so on, Indians among each other. So you see, talking about decolonization is like being an adolescent and, you know, fulminating against your father. Now, that father has been gone for 75 years. There's nobody here who has lived through the colonial period, nobody who had any merit in decolonization. So let's, let's stop talking about it. Um, now, let's um, uh, apply this vision to some practical lessons that Hindus could take. And so uh, let me make it very clear that I am not voicing these criticisms of Hindu behavior because I have anything against Hindus. On the contrary, I want Hindus to win. And so the mistakes some of them are making are hurdles, are precisely preventing them to win. So, you know, you could compare it with the um, wielding of a red pencil by a school teacher. Mm -hmm. You see, if you write one plus one is five, then I don't hate you. I don't want to damage you if I simply coolly, unemotionally notice that this is wrong. So I wield my red pencil wrong. And, and so that's for your own good, you see. It's better that you learn that one and one does not equal five. So there is a lack of self-criticism. I think I already mentioned the um, California textbook affair, where you see Hindus were essentially right, but they made a few mistakes. And... So because of these mistakes, you know, their claims about the Aryan invasion theory, which were precocious, which were essentially correct, but precocious in the, in the circumstances. You see, the, there was no victory yet. The Aryan invasion is still assumed by many. And so because of this, they suffered a complete defeat. They didn't get most of the edits passed. Uh, the first time, they tried the second time, they lost again. Then they went to court, they lost. Then they went to appeals court and they lost again. It was as complete a defeat as you can get. Now, when I wrote this, immediately I got all this hate mail from Hindus. <laughs> How do you dare to say we defeated? We are defeated. Well, because that's a fact. <laughs> that's what happened. And so 
if you can't distinguish be between victory and defeat, what are you doing on a battlefield? Because this is a battlefield, you see. People want to belittle Hinduism, you know, are arguing against Hinduism. You are in a position of being forced to defend yourself, whether you like it or not. So you are on a battlefield. Isn't it time that you, you reform your mentality and start to understand, okay, we're not here for praising ourselves, we're here to win. Then uh, there is the problem of literalism. Um, you know, people take scripture too seriously, as if scripture is absolute, as if it is God-given. Whereas so many scriptures are clearly human work, and some of them are not even very good. You know, you have stuff that is very good, like the Rig Veda, but you have also things like the Bhavishya Purana, which I see very many Hindus quote. The Bhavishya Purana is the, the, the history of the future. And so it's full of predictions. And so many of them have never come true. And also there are fake predictions mm -hmm. that, they, that they claim to be writing about the future when they're actually talking about the past and so on. So you see, taking that serious rather than taking a critical look, you see, what is this text worth? You know, that's a surefire formula for defeat. Do you want that? Um, Something I see, well, it, it can happen to anyone, but is very popular among Hindus, is a lack of time depth. Mm -hmm. You see, when you look at the starry sky, you see the moon that is close, Jupiter is a bit farther, Sirius is even farther, Antares is even farther, and yet you see them on one canvas, as if somebody made a painting with the moon, with Jupiter, with Sirius, with Antares. And so this way, Hindus look into the past. You know, I, I wrote this article about the, the Aryan invasion question, which all takes place 6,000 to 4,000 years ago. And so the editor of the piece thought that he was being clever by showing a map which shows not immigration into India, but immigration from India. Now, that's nice. But the map is about something totally different. You see, when the human race, Homo sapiens, spread from Africa along the coast of the Indian Ocean, they came in India, from where they continue to Australia and so on. But there, a group in India went inland. Mm -hmm. And so in Central Asia, then some went to Europe, some went to China, even to America. Uh, all very interesting. And so it shows the importance of India in the spread of humanity. However, that took place something like 70, 80,000 years ago. It has nothing to do with the Aryan invasion question. And so, you see, to, to explain this to Hindus, my God, you see, I've, I've done it so many times and often it hasn't succeeded because they keep comparing this thing from the past with that thing from the past. You see, to them, the past is, is one canvas and they see no difference between things 6,000 and, and 80,000 years ago. Um, like uh, many people say in the West that um, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali had it all from Buddhism. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly true, although there are a few Buddhist elements in it. Um, but they use this argument, ah, no, 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 Yoga does not come from Buddha, because Buddha had it all from the Yoga Sutra. Well, as far as we know, the Yoga Sutra is centuries younger than the Buddha. So, um, or for instance, something that Hindus don't realize is that words have a history. Like the word Arya, they say, oh, it has nothing to do with language, it has nothing to do with race, it means noble. Well, yeah, later it has come to mean noble. In the Vedas, that's not the meaning. In the Vedas, the meaning is fellow countrymen, us, as against them. And so it hasn't got a moral meaning, except in the primitive sense. You see, for primitive people, you were safe if you were with your own countrymen. You were in danger if you were left to the mercies of foreigners. So in that sense, you see, there is a shading over between us and good. 
And but you see, you have to be aware of all this, and you have to be aware of the evolution of the meaning of the word. Or another example, adhyatmika. Mm -hmm. You see, adhyatmika nowadays is used in the sense of spiritual, mm -hmm. referring to atma, the the Vedantic concept of self, mm -hmm. the self. Now. Atma originally means self in a very ordinary sense, no philosophical stuff. It means like I wash myself, I see myself in the mirror, or for example, I am self-reliant. Bharat Atma Nirbhar. See, you see, there you have self in the ordinary meaning of not the other, but myself. And so from that has been developed by philosophical reflection, the concept of the self. But so Adhyatmika originally has this ordinary meaning. Like for instance, in, in, in Ayurveda in, and in the concomitant Sankhya philosophy, you have this notion of, you have three forms of suffering. Adhidaivika, coming from the gods, or in secular terms, by coincidence. Um, Adhibhautika, coming from the elements. So a natural necessity, following from the properties of different materials and so on. Or it can be adhyatmika. You see, um, why do you get lung cancer? You see, it may be for no reason at all. You know, you were born with this fate or however you call it, you get it. Or it can be because of natural causes, Maybe you were in some accident of radioactivity that somehow affected your lungs and that's where you got cancer. But it may be adhyatmika. It may have been brought upon you by yourself because you were a tobacco smoker. See, uh, so that's the ordinary meaning of adhyatmika and then later it also got a spiritual meaning. And these two should not be confused. And so unfortunately I see lots of that. Um, the over-evaluation of words, as if words prove anything. Like you have the word itihasa. You see, itihasa means thus it happened, which in fact is exactly the definition of history by the father of the modern science of historiography, Leopold, uh, Leopold von Ranke. Uh, who said, you see, history is reconstructing the things as they really have been. Um, so, you know, in the whole discussion about Sanskrit untranslatables, it is said that itihasa is something different from mythology, that I agree, but they assume, oh, it is also something different from history. Now, that I don't agree. It was, of course, primitive history, a lot of embellishment and ideological streamlining and so on, like the Bible, for instance. But nevertheless, it's based on real events. It's not invented, it's not mythological. Um, now, anyway, because of this word itihasa, I've actually heard Sanskrit scholars, scholars shouting with lots of conviction, ah, this proves that the science of history was invented by Hindus. Well, well, well. Then you have the phenomenon of fanciful etymologies. You know, England is Angulistan. And you see, my language, P.N. Oak, you see, the famous author of all these fanciful etymologies, he once wrote a letter to me telling me that my mother tongue, Dutch, is the language of the Daityas, which are a kind of demons, not even really a compliment, but okay. And so the whole world, you know, can be reduced to Sanskrit models. Well, anyway, there is a defective uh, logic. You see, sometimes you have your facts correct, but then you draw the wrong conclusions. Um, like a famous case in the discussion about caste is the case of Satyakam Jabala. This is from the Upanishads. Um, so he's the son of a woman called Jabali. And she's a maid servant. And so she, she goes to clean the house of some rich family. And then the next day she goes to clean in the house of another rich family and so on. And as happened in the 
pre-Me Too uh, days, many of these landlords uh, would take sexual advantage of their maids. And so she has quite a few lovers. And one day she gets pregnant and she doesn't know by whom. Now, this uh, Jabala goes to a guru who wants to become his pupil, but then he realizes, yeah, but you see, this guru is going to ask me, who am I? That is to say, what genealogy do I have? And so he asks his mother, okay, you see, all my friends here, they have a father. I don't. Who is my father? And she says, well, you see, I did this and that, and I don't know who your father is. And so he goes to the guru, and he gets indeed this question, and he very honestly says, I don't know. You see, especially since he had prepared the whole thing, he could have invented a story. Oh, you see, my father is a sailor, and his ship sank, and he's not there anymore, or something. Now he doesn't. He honestly says, well, you know, my father is <laughs> someone. <laughs> and uh, so the guru says, well, then I'll accept you as my pupil. Mm -hmm. Why? Now, modern Hindu apologists say, ah, it's because the boy was truthful. Mm. That makes him a Brahmin, who supposedly have as their caste quality truthfulness. Mm -hmm. And so it's not by birth. Your birth is not important. Well, you see, the explanation given by Hindus for the past 2,000 years, mm. until one or two generations ago, was exactly the opposite. They said, okay, the Guru saw that this boy is truthful. Mm. Why is he truthful? Ah, because he takes after his father, of course. Mm. And so his father must have been truthful. And who is truthful? Ah, but the Brahmins are truthful. So this boy is a Brahmin, so he can become my pupil. Now, that's not necessary. Maybe the modern reason reasoning is better. But then you should take into account that you are dealing with a rival explanation that is casteist. And so if you argue that caste is not in, that birth, caused by birth is not important, then you have to manage to overrule that other explanation, which I see no one doing. So uh, there is the problem of ignoring facts. I've many times had this discussion about the origin of astrology with uh, Hindus claiming that it's all of Hindu origin. Vedic astrology, in the bookstores you have all these books about Vedic astrology, they are in fact about horoscopes. And though there existed some kind of astrology in the Vedas, it was not individual horoscopes. You could determine a, a good time depending on the position of the stars. Sometimes we're propitious for build, starting a new building or going to war or contracting a marriage. And some moments were not so good. And so one remainder of this is the present-day Hindu habit of choosing particular times for weddings. Uh, anyway, so that existed, but that's not horoscopy. You see, the system of making horoscopes came from Babylon and was brought into India by the Greeks. And so you can see there are many Greek influences in the first books of, of astrology. You know, the first one of which is called Yavana Jataka. You see the birth horoscopes of the Greeks. And so originally, for instance, the signs of the zodiac were named with their Greek names. And then only later were these translated. But even then, they were only translations of the Greek names. They were not like the Chinese names, for example. Um, and a number of technical terms are taken from Greek. Like, for instance, Kendra means the house of horoscope on one of the corners, one of the angles. Now, that's the Greek word kentron, which is still with us in the English form center, um, and, and so on. I mean, there are numerous signs of this Greek origin. And so I mean, they just look past it. They give no account of this, no explanation of this. Maybe there is some way to explain this away. Well, they don't even try. Well, just, just ignore it. Well, I don't like that. Um, limited horizon. You see, they love to quote, let noble thoughts come to us from all sides. Look, these Vedic people were so 
universal, you know. And yet they themselves, you see, can't really think of the outside world, except in negative terms. I mean, me as a foreigner, of course, I've been called all kinds of names on Twitter. Uh, so, you see, nationalism in India was, of course, useful and normal and understandable during the, the freedom struggle, but that's long ago, you know. So here I sympathize with Jawaharlal Nehru. You see, in his famous independence speech, he said that, you know, we have to rededicate ourselves to India and to the larger cause of humanity. Well, that's exactly the, the correct viewpoint. I agree. Long live Nehru. Then uh, moralism. Yes, I gave the example of the word Arya. So it has the neutral meaning of compatriot. The meaning good is only derivative. And, you know, it took time before that became the meaning. A very important one is that they personalize issues. Really great problem. You see, why did Aurangzeb commit all these atrocities against Hindus? Oh, Aurangzeb was a tyrant. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there were more tyrants in history. I'm sure that, you know, I haven't particularly studied it, but many of the Hindu kings were certainly tyrants. But you see, they didn't go destroying places of worship because that was not part of the ideology that they had been groomed in. If Aurangzeb had been a fanatical Jain, he would not have gone around destroying mosques or temples or whatever. You know, if, if you're a fanatical Jain, maybe you become a fanatical ascetic, you see, becoming, you know, that you can count your ribs and, and stuff like that. Uh, but because he, he chose Islam, now that explains it. You know, and in fact, he was a, in some respects, he was a very good man. At least he was a pious man. If you think religion is a good thing, well, he had religion. But because he had religion, he did that which Islam told him to do. Yeah, then you have simple, well, untruths. Lies, I hesitate to accuse someone of lies because a lie again means intention. You know, if somebody says something that's not true, well, maybe he believes it. He's just mistaken about it. You know, that, that has to be investigated separately. But, you know, some things are really false. Like, for example, I've heard many Hindus say, ah, the NASA satellite photography has proven that the bridge between Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka was man-made. It was made by the, the Vanara army with uh, Rama. Well, I think that's false. Um, there is the false Macaulay quote. In fact, in a conference just, just a few days ago, you know, the, the, the local organizer who was introducing me actually gave that quote in all seriousness. It's a famous quote. It starts with, I have traveled the length and breadth of India, and I've never seen a beggar or a thief, and they're so noble and so great, and this is thanks to their fantastic culture. And the only way we can subdue them is to destroy this culture. And that's why I am now proposing English education rather than Sanskrit education. Now, you see, I've investigated where this comes from and so on. I did an article about it uh, showing that this is not true. But even before I started investigating it, when I just saw the text, I knew it was a forgery. Because in this stage of colonialism, you see, every colonialist even when he was producing or proposing a scheme that would end up disastrous for the natives, he would still present it as beneficial. And so, you see, this, 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 this discourse just doesn't fit. And indeed, you see, Macaulay was fairly positive towards the Indians. He already thought, unlike most colonialists at the time, he already thought of conferring independence upon the Indians, or making the Indians equal with the British. But to achieve that, they first had to be anglicized. Because you see, now, you know, it's just primitive, uh, superstitious, and so on. So just as the, the British, by learning Latin and so on, have, you know, gotten civilized, 
this way the Indians have to become civilized thanks to English. Uh, so, you know, his motives are a bit more complex than to say, ah, he wanted to destroy India. No, no. Um, yeah, well then, the missed opportunities. This perhaps is a bit outdated. I think here there's something changing. The example I gave is the Battle of Bahraj of 1033. Uh, this is where a Muslim invader, Salar Masood Ghaznavi, the nephew of Mahmoud Ghaznavi, was defeated by a coalition of Hindus. Now, Hindus love to complain, oh, we Hindus have no unity. Well, there you had unity. And unity comes automatically, you see. It's not like this RSS talk. Ah, unity, Hindu unity. No, 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 no. You, you don't need to talk about unity. But when you have a common enemy yes. or a common challenge, then unity comes automatically. And so they defeated him. There was a very colorful character in this coalition, namely Raja Bhoja, the philosopher king with his uh, Singhasana Bhatisi and, and so on. So you can make a really good movie, a really interesting movie about this with a happy ending, moreover. Um, so Hindus should do this. Now, meanwhile, already a book about this phase has appeared, you know, some historical fiction. And so you can go on and make a movie of this. So rather than these Nehruvian propaganda movies, like Mohule Azam or Joda Akbar or <laughs> Padmawat or so, you know, you can make your own, you know, pro-Hindu movies. Real history, yeah. but incidentally also pro-Hindu. Um, there is a willful disunity among Hindus. You know, they always manage to find a reason to quarrel. And there's nothing against that, except that when you're faced with an enemy, it's yeah. time to forget about this and unite against this enemy. Um, and then finally, you see, again in the, in the Aryan invasion debate, I've noted so many times that people who were originally willing to discuss with you were put off by the bad manners of Hindu polemicists. Now, again, this is not exclusively Hindu, but you see... There is a reason why you can't say, ah, but the others also do it. You see, that doesn't count, because you are in a different position than them. You are on the defensive. You are fighting an uphill battle. So they can afford certain things, which you cannot. And so, you know, it's time to take this strategic situation serious, and therefore to behave, you know, with the constraints that happen to be part of your situation. Anyway, so this is, you know, one good thing about it is that it's a reminder of a happier phase when Hindus felt superior to others. Mm -hmm. You see, Hindus love to complain about their inferiority complex. But not so long ago, only a thousand years ago, which is quite recent in Indian history, you see, Hindus had a superiority complex. Because at that time, you see, people came from China, you know, on pilgrimage to India. India was the place to be. The Arabs, you see, they called their girls Hind. The, the main enemy of Muhammad was the first lady of Mecca called Hind. Now, you know, why? You see, girls' names typically refer to opulence, to prosperity. You know, like in English, Kimberley refers to a diamond mine called Kimberley. And so here, you see, girls are called Hind. Why? Because... India was the, you know, that what everybody thought of when the word prosperity and, and advancement and so on fell. Um, like Mohandis, an engineer in, in Arabic, comes again from the same root, Hind. So somebody who practices the Indian science, you know, physics, exact science, that was associated with India. At the time, India was ahead of all the rest. So at that time, maybe Hindus had some reason to feel superior. Uh, this uh, Al-Biruni in the 11th century describes it. He says, oh, Hindus think that there is no country like theirs. If you tell them about a scientist in Persia, they don't believe you. Because they think, you know, everything of value is Indian. And so th there is a bit of a remainder of that mentality. So what is to be done? 
Well, you know, you have to take uh, you have to take education seriously. You have to set yourself high standards. That's obvious. Here, I'm just slamming an open door, but it's it's necessary to say it because apparently some people, you know, <laughs> need it. So you see, to sum up, you should stop criticizing those that count as authorities and be the authority yourself.